Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is in China on a two-day visit, hot on the heels of the China-U.S. high-level meeting in Alaska. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State is visiting European allies for policy coordination. So, what is in the timing of this? How will China and Russia look to coordinate their policies? And how are all these major power relations evolving? To talk about those issues and more, I'm joined by Cui Hongjian, Director of the Department for European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies, Pavel Fagenhauer, a Russian defense analyst, and Peter Kuznick, Professor of History at American University. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, let me start with you, Hongjian. Well, uh, the COVID situation obviously has curtailed a lot of diplomatic travels, and this is the first time uh, a foreign diplomat visited China. What does it say about China-Russia relations? As we know, the China and Russia now is uh, uh, all around the strategic uh, coordination partnership. So I think it's very normal for those two countries to keep their. Uh, you know, uh, uh, communication and also even coordination. Uh, as we understand at this time, uh, for Minister Ravrov, uh, his visit to China, I think the uh, task for both two countries, firstly, uh, try to help uh, come back to track, uh, come back to normal. I mean, for this uh, uh, bilateral cooperation. Uh, also, we know that uh, there are a lot of the uh, areas or fields for both two countries. Just like uh, uh, Minister Lavrov mentioned that uh, last year, mm -hmm. the China and the Russia they have uh, more than 500, I mean, online uh, event. So this year, as we know, because of the uh, uh, easy uh, epidemic, so there are more uh, expected uh, agents for agenda for both two countries. But of course, I think that uh, not only uh, on this uh, bilateral level, on uh, regional level, and also global level. Uh, China and Russia, they do have a lot of the, uh, issues uh, to be uh, touched. For example, how to keep the, uh, I mean, global strategic uh, uh, sta uh, stabili uh, uh, stabil uh, stability, especially after the, uh, uh, you know, uh, United States or American administration changed uh, some, I mean, somehow the uh, policy towards Russia and China, and also some other regional issue. Uh, for example, the uh, recent visit by uh, 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 Secretary of uh, State of the United States in Asia. So I think, uh, yes, on bilateral level, regional level, and global level, there are a lot of mm. issues uh, to be uh, talked by uh, both two ministers. Pavel, do you share uh, Hong Jian's uh, uh, take on the change of the American policies towards Russia and China? And what kind of changes do you think uh, has happened? Well, Russian-American relations were frosty. Now they're in a nosedive after, uh, and actually the Russian ambassador has been recalled from Washington for consultation, and no one knows when he's going to go back to post. And this is a very serious diplomatic crisis, and the United States and the Chinese officials had a very stormy meeting in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, America is sort of pushing China and Russia closer and closer together. That's a fact. And there, so there's be much more cooperation and coordination, uh, well, already kind of bordering maybe on a sort of alliance between mm. these two states, Russia and China, uh, as opposed to the United States and its allies. Uh, Peter, uh, while the Chinese and Russian foreign ministers are meeting here in China, yes. uh, Secretary Blinken is traveling to Brussels uh, from Monday to Thursday to attend a meeting of NATO leaders uh, and, and engage with EU leaders as well. So, uh, Peter, uh, what is he hoping to accomplish and is it also thinking about the Chinese and Russian foreign ministers meeting here in China? Everybody right now is trying to shore up their alliances. Uh, the, it, before the meeting last, the uh, United States, Kent Sullivan met with the uh, met with Japan, met with South Korea, 
Biden held a conference with the members of the Quad. The United States right now is very much intent upon confronting China with the United States. So uh, after four years of Trump, when the United States was largely accepted from the international scene in a positive way, now the United States is trying to for that. Biden's strategy is to strengthen ties with NATO, which Trump had denigrated, and to strengthen ties with the EU. And it's in order to be against China and Russia as much as possible. And uh, already Blinken has, uh, has been consulting with EU officials to see whether they can work together on the basis of their shared values to address the global challenges from Iran, China, and Russia. Uh, Peter, do these countries pose the same kind of challenges to the United States? And, and do Europeans and Americans think alike in this area? No, it's interesting. If you look at what the United, what the United States has been doing this last week, what Biden is trying to do is differentiate himself from Trump's policy when it comes to Russia, and he's doubling down on Trump's policy when it comes to China. Mm -hmm. I think we're in a very precarious moment right now because the, the heightened of these conflicts with both Russia and China at the same time. You know, instead of more cooperative policy, it, it is, is very, very dangerous. So we're creating a world, polarized world, a world of confrontation, conflict that could erupt into something much more dangerous at any moment now. And speaking ahead of his trip, Lavrov uh, emphasized the importance of mutual respect in relations between China and Russia. Let's take a listen. For us, China is a truly strategic partner of Russia and a like-minded country, and our cooperation in the international arena is conducive to global and regional stability. We believe the mutual trust and respectful dialogue between China and Russia should serve as an example to other countries, especially those countries who intend to make contact with China and Russia based on unequal rules. And Hong Jian, of course, we uh, presume that the United States will be a major talking point for the top diplomats from China and Russia. Uh, but uh, do the two sides share exactly the same approaches and strategies towards the United States? What are the commonalities and differences? Now, I think that uh, it's a very, very important time for China and Russia to uh, coordinate, especially uh, uh, on the, under the pressure from the uh, United States on some issues like uh, human rights or like some other, for example, uh, technology, sciences, and also even uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, stability and, and so on. Also some original issue like uh, Iran uh, nuclear issue and the uh, DPRK issue and some other. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, uh, to some degree uh, this pressure or this uh, uh, opponents from uh, opposition from the uh, United States uh, is to getting uh, is getting the uh, China and Russia closer and closer, but I think that uh, at the same time, uh, China and Russia will insist that uh, uh, they will not be uh, in an alliance and they just uh, in a, a partnership. So I think to keep this balance between uh, you know uh, alliance and the partnership will be very important for those two countries. On the other hand, that uh, Certainly, uh, they do. Uh, they can share some uh, experience uh, to do something. For example, how to uh, fight against uh, these uh, sanctions imposed by United States and some other European countries, mm. and they can have some more uh, coordination uh, in the uh, occasions like uh, United Nations or some other. But of course, at the same time, I think they do have some uh, different approaches towards. Uh, the uh, relations with the uh, uh, United States and some other European countries. Because as we know, especially the very, very uh, big size of economic uh, cooperation or exchange mm. between China and the U.S. and uh, between chi China and the European countries, it's very different from this uh, economic uh, uh, situation uh, between uh, Russia and the United States. 
Uh, so I think, uh, yes, they do f uh, try to find some uh, common uh, stance and also uh, some even uh, mm -hmm. common reactions uh, to fight against some, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 sanctions from uh, Western countries. But at the same time, I think China also try to find its own way to deal with the uh, more and more compli complicated situation. And Pavel, uh, the fact that the Chinese and Americans have met in Alaska shows that China is willing to mend ties with the U.S. But does Russia also have the same wish to mend ties with Washington? I will continue to speak uh, to Washington. That's imperative for both China and Russia. Everyone understands that. That should be done. These all three nations are nuclear powers, great military and economic powers, what with China and America. And that means that they have to talk to each other. There's, they, they should talk to each other, and they will talk to each other, though right now between uh, Washington and Moscow, well, it's not very much talk. It's more uh, exchanging bribe, bribes between each other mm. and calling names. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the understanding is there. Uh, but that does not, but uh, the way it's going to be done is, very, is different. And there are serious problems because, as it's seen from Moscow, uh, the United States is trying to de 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 legitimize the Russian regime of President Vladimir Putin, and apparently trying to do the same with uh, Beijing, uh, using a, a, a so-called human rights issues and other issues. And so that's a thing that both, nation, both Russia and China have to deal with, that the United States is trying to uh, undermine their internal stability to some extent, and that means undermine their international standing. That means there's going to be a lot of similar reaction from both Russia and China, though it's of course true that the America and uh, Russia do not have much trade at all, and America and China have lots of trade. Uh, but still, there's a lot of co in common in the relationships between these two countries, uh, these three countries, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, two, two countries, Russia and China, as opposed to the United States right now. And Peter earlier mentioned that it is probably a little bit beyond him that why Biden wants to alienate two major powers at the same time, namely China and Russia. What do Russians think about the American strategy? Pavel? Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Russian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, R Russian uh, uh, right now uh, understanding of America is that, um, well, they, they are actually trying to uh, uh, push Russia out of a number of places where we are, are very important to us. It's actually seen as a, almost a hybrid war uh, declared on Russia. That's how the Russian leadership sees it, uh, where America and its allies are fight, trying to kind of use hybrid war uh, 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 assets to undermine the Russian regime. And that means that we are in a semi kind of war situation and we're seeking al allies, if not allies, at least partners that will work together with us. Of course, Russia and China are not uh, allies. Uh, formally speaking, no, neither country gave pledges to fight for the other. But in uh, practical terms, uh, it's uh, very close to an alliance because we, there, there's the same issue for both sides right now. A At least it's very close. Uh, these issues are very earlier, close. earlier, Pavel, you mentioned there are some exchange of barbs between Moscow and, and Washington. And actually, Biden characterized President Putin as a killer, and his top national security aides also publicly criticized China at the meeting in Alaska. So does it mean that it will be more difficult for Russia to sit down with the U.S. in future negotiations of anything? Pavel? 
Well, it's, it's going to be, a, yes, a very serious problem right now. Um, to, for, for the time being, we're not on sp much on speaking terms. Uh, President Putin proposed the kind of open to the press uh, dialogue with um, the, uh, Joe Biden. The Americans do not want that. Uh, how, how and what we're going to talk about is not clear. Uh, Russian officials and the Russian media are calling Joe Biden senile and not ready for office. So there's a lot of tension. Uh, there has been uh, agreements to, talk, to discuss uh, strategic nuclear stability. Uh, most likely such exchanges will happen. But can they achieve anything when the atmosphere is so bad? I don't know. Then there's, pro there's also possibilities of further uh, tensions growing in the, between Moscow and Washington. Uh, the situation is getting, at, I, I would say, rather worse than better. Uh, we'll have to, of course, uh, we can hope that the uh, leaders of both sides will find the ways to kind of put this present mm. uh, very unpleasant situation behind them. Uh, but right now, I don't know how that can happen anytime soon. Uh, Peter, probably in the calculation of President Biden is that uh, the alliance with Europeans and, and Japan uh, and, and Australia is, is a strong commitment for him to talk tough and act tough on China and Russia. But do you think he has got enough uh, commitment from those allies? I think Biden is just in the beginning of his administration, really. Uh, just past the 50-day mark, and he's trying to set a certain tone right now. He's, his theme is that America is back and that the United States is ready to become the world leader. Uh, he's got this fantasy about the United States went during the unipolar period, before Afghanistan went so bad, before Iraq went so bad, before Libya went so bad, before the Syrian situation has gotten out of hand. Uh, and he wants to reassert U.S. leadership, which means U.S. domination, really. Uh, nobody wants that. Hmm. And the, it, the world has changed. But without the cooperation from Russians and Chinese, the problem of Syria, Afghanistan, and Iran won't go that easily. Doesn't he understand that? I, um, he should understand that. He's been around for a long time. He's, he's got some expertise in foreign policy, and his outreach on Afghanistan is much more positive than his relationship with Russia and China right now. In fact, he's calling for and uh, working with Russia and China to stabilize the situation in Afghanistan, which makes a lot of sense. We have to do the same thing on the Korean Peninsula. We've got to do this. We've got to be working together on, cli on climate change, deal with global warming, deal with pandemics, deal with poverty, deal with arms control. We've got so much we should be working on, but to start off on such a hostile footing, mm -hmm. the way the in uh, behaved in Alaska, and now calling Putin a killer is setting, is thro putting, throwing down a gauntlet to China and Russia and saying the United States is back, but in a hostile, confrontational way. And it's as but if do it's you a think zero this pre-calculated strategy or just off the off-the-cuff remarks. When I look at the people who Biden has appointed, these are the hawks. These are the old cold warriors. These are people who brought us Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and U.S. policy in Syria. So Biden has been more moderate than the people around him, but the tone is coming out of the Blinkens and the Sullivans and, you know, the and the Newlands and the power, the, the ones who want to make an issue of the things that separate us rather than find common grounds on the things that unite us. Mm. And that's, you know, and then assuming that he's made a, this strong statement, it shows how strong we are, then behind the scenes maybe we can negotiate. Mm. But Biden but still said he's the, well, pretty proud what his Secretary of State did in Alaska. Yeah, he, he supported it, that. Uh, but the, look at how the Chinese responded. 
You know, then they went through a list of all the things that the United States is doing wrong. They went through the U.S. imperialism. They went through the U.S. wars. They went through human rights in the United States. They talked about Black Lives Matter. You know, the United States has not done so well in the world right. of late. We got 550,000 dead from coronavirus. The U.S. economy is still not recovered. Uh, we've got racial issues here, human rights issues here. The United States is not in a position to mm -hmm. be lecturing others on human rights, on economics and, and other policies yeah. right now. And so, but everybody's pointing out the American hypocrisy. And if we look at the response from Iran and the response from North Korea, clearly people are standing up to the United States now in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the United States to be lecturing and bullying and posturing right now is the opposite of what needs to be done. And Hong Jian, uh, what are the Europeans thinking now? They also, I think, appreciate the fact that Americans power has been compromised, his standing has been in decline because of their performances. But uh, will Europeans still draw, uh, come on board with the U.S. in terms of their strategy against Russians and Chinese? No, I think for uh, European side, now uh, it's in a very, I mean, complicated uh, or even a uh, twisted thinking about this situation. On the one hand, that uh, European countries try, especially in the name of a uh, European Union, they try to be part of the uh, uh, great power gaming between China and the U.S. and Russia. So we can find out recently, uh, European Union uh, showed a more, uh, I mean, tougher. Uh, uh, stance on some uh, uh, issues like human rights or some other. But at the same time, I think that uh, European countries still, uh, they are looking for more benefits, especially for uh, cooperation with China uh, in trade investment. Uh, if we look at the uh, uh, finish of the uh, negotiation on CAI between China and the EU uh, in the last year, mm -hmm. and also at the same time, uh, European countries uh, still try to get a kind of uh, uh, constructive relations with Russia because of the uh, energy issue and also because of the uh, uh, geographic I mean, situation. But at the same time, I think that especially after uh, Biden uh, takes the power in White House, now it looks like uh, European countries, they try to get closer uh, in some uh, political or security issue with Washington or some other even uh, coordination uh, in some uh, uh, field like uh, human rights to uh, take some uh, same action uh, with the United States. But at the same time, I think that uh, uh, finally the European countries try to keep a balance between China, U.S. and Russia. If we look at this, uh, I mean, uh, track, we can find out this uh, logic behind these uh, actions or policies in European countries. Uh, like uh, once European countries get some cooperation with China or get some, uh, uh, I mean, engagement with Russia at the same time or next step, they will try to impose some uh, negative, uh, I mean, uh, uh, action against China and Russia. So it looks like uh, the logic for mm -hmm. the European countries is they will not, they don't want, they don't, they don't want to pick side between China and the U.S. and Russia, but at the same time, they try to get some benefits from this gaming between major powers. And Pavel, what about uh, Europe-Russia relationship? Uh, of course, Russia has been sanctioned by EU because what uh, the opposition Navalny has been through, but will things improve? Well, Europe, of course, is not, uh, it's a very complex kind of part of the world. <coughs> Their different European nations have different attitudes. There's quite a number of European nations, say, like Italy, Spain, Portugal, or Hungary, say, that uh, try to kind of keep good relations and, uh, and constructive relations with Moscow. Other European nations have uh, more... A belligerent uh, attitude towards Moscow. Yeah. There were attempts to rebuild. The, the, there was this 
a visit in January by Burrell, the uh, foreign uh, policy chief of the European Union to Moscow, which turned out to be a total disaster. I talked to diplomats here in Moscow who were organizing that visit. They said, we don't understand it. put so much effort into it and it went so badly. So right now, Europe, of course, does not see any much threat coming from China. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, when they talk about China, it's more kind of out of uh, solidarity with the United States. But many Europeans see a problem with Russia, and uh, they have been able to work out a, a more or less common position, though of course saying that we should talk to Russia, mm. we should find constructive outcomes. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, and they need America, they believe they need America uh, to uh, in the, any possible standoff with Russia that may happen. Okay. Uh, so it's a kind of complicated, fluid situation, uh, but th uh, right now they're finding ways to uh, hammer out a position that Moscow does not really like that much. About China-Russia relation itself, uh, I know this year is the China-Russia Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation's 20th anniversary. But uh, in what areas, uh, in terms of security, economic cooperation and trade, can the two countries move uh, even closer in terms of cooperation? Uh, let me start with you, Hong Jian, first. I think uh, just like uh, Mr. Lafroff uh, received the uh, interview, uh, he mentioned that uh, not only in this uh, traditional cooperation between two countries, just like you mentioned energy and also some uh, uh, defense, and I think now especially very, very important cooperation between China and Russia is how to keep the maybe a high level exchange on the uh, uh, strategic uh, coordination to deal with the issues of the uh, sanctions from uh, Western countries against uh, both two countries. Another one is how to uh, have a more uh, sciences and technology cooperation, mm. especially when both two countries are facing the common I mean, yeah. challenges from uh, Western countries. Pavel, what is your take? Uh, is there any chances of uh, upgrade of technological uh, and research uh, cooperation? Oh, yes, that's really the main issue right now. It's um, the space cooperation, it's, pos it's um, uh, aeronautics cooperation, uh, it's um, uh, defense industry cooperation. I mean, under Western pressure and Western sanctions to work together to produce, uh, go to the moon and actually work on a joint building joint airplanes together and uh, building actually maybe military hardware together, uh, that would be uh, the next kind of frontier for Russia-Chinese uh, cooperation. Uh, something like it happened, say, in the 50s when uh, there was a lot of technological transfer between the two countries. Uh, that's right now, we're on the verge of that. Mm. That would be a great leap forward when Russia and China, if they begin uh, closely cooperating in, technologic, in technology. And Peter, uh, if China and Russia come closer in security policies coordination, what would be the issue that the Americans worry the most? Americans would be very worried if they go further in terms of military alliance. Both uh, Putin and Xi have been saying that that's not needed right now, but they're all they're talking about that in the same sense that NATO is talking about orienting more toward China and toward uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, so the thing that I fear the most to worry about is a military confrontation. We've got a lot of dangerous situations that have become more dangerous as both sides are becoming more provocative no. in the South China Sea, in uh, the Strait of Taiwan. So the, the United States is pushing Russia and China together because of, of its hostile stances All right. toward both. And All right. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Pavel and Hong Jian. You've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhou in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.